This is a review of the process control material for the process control course. We're going to go through a practice exam and just look at some of the sample questions, some things that might be asked on the final exam. Let's first of all just go through a flow chart of this. We've got um, down here below we have uh, an overview of the class. So we have first of all controller design. We select the actuator and the measurement. We determine if there's data available. If there's not, we might design a model with physics based uh, and then maybe linearize that. If we need to get some sample data, if we want to simulate our physics based model, we can go back and collect that with simulated data and then do a step test. From that, get a second or first order model uh, with a graphical fit or regression. And then we want to get back to you know, a first or second order model. Uh, and then on down, if there's a measure disturbance, we might design a feed forward controller. And then we go on to the controller design down here, where we select, you know, P only, PI or PID controller, based on if it's an integrating system. We can do stability analysis with uh, Routh arrays, root locus plots, Bode plots, and others. And then we use tuning correlations to come up with good first parameter values that we can use for our PID controller. And then finally we come over here to controller performance where we tune the PID controller and adjust the KC tau i and tau d until we get acceptable performance. Okay, so that's an overview of the class. Uh, we're going to go down through first of all just some definitions here. Uh, the very first thing is to draw a block diagram for a feedback control loop with a PID controller with derivative on measurement. Now we're going to include the blocks for the valve, measurement, process, and load, any other necessary blocks. So let's just go through this. We have uh, KM, that's going to be our gain for our measurement. And then we're going to add in uh, uh, the PI controller. Okay, and then our valve, and then here's our process, and then we go to our load, all right, and then add our measurement coming back. Now we use GM here instead of the KM because the GM might include the dynamics of the measurement, whereas up above we only want to use KM because you instantaneously turn the uh, desired set point into the measurement signal to compare with the measurement. So GM, that might have an output, for example, of milliamps, uh, and we want to convert uh, the set point into like a milliamp signal, for example. All right, and then if we do derivative on measurement, we have the derivative term, so we just have to add that in here, GD, which is just going to be separate from the GPI, uh, and, and that's because we we want to split off this um, lower value which is our measured value, our y value, and uh, then add that in after the PI block. All right, let's go on down to the next one. Uh, why does uh, offset typically occur with P only control and not with PI control? So offset occurs with P only control because uh, the integral action, the integral action um, is going to remove uh, the steady, any kind of steady state offset. Okay, so integral action uh, removes any kind of offset. And if you have an integrating system, then the system itself will remove that offset. Um, but in PI control, even with an integrating system, um, you can also have zero offset. All right, next we're gonna show the standard form for both the second order and first order transfer functions and explain all of the terms. So let's go ahead and start with the first order. Uh, first order is just gonna be G of S and that is going to be equal to KP uh, divided by tau P uh, S plus 1 and then we'll put in the time delay here as well 
and then a second order uh, second order system is going to be similar except the denominator is going to be a little bit different we're gonna have our gain and then we're gonna have our second order time constant and let's put in two zeta tau s times s plus one all right and this is e to the minus theta p s and that gives us our time delay so we have our gain up top uh, we have our time constant and then we have our delay for the first order system and then we have our gain our second order time constant our damping factor and then delay for the second order system okay so now we're going to talk about why is the time constant for a first order system 63.2 percent of the total change to a steady state so if we have a step input our time constant that's going to be measured by the amount of time that it takes for us to get 0.632 of the final way to delta y okay so 63.2 percent of delta y or I can put a little delta y in here uh, 0.632 times that delta y okay so let's just go ahead and uh, start with the solution to a step response okay so that is going to be y of t um, equals and then we'll have 1 minus e to the minus and this is going to be t divided by tau p all right and then times kp and delta u okay so that's the analytical solution to a step input um, of input delta u and that's going to be the response y of t uh, now if we plug in one time constant so t equals tau p and just plug that in right up there this right here becomes 1 minus e to the negative 1 divided by 1 and that is going to equal 0 0.632 and then I have the kp delta u but if I go with my definition of kp that's delta y over delta u and so if I if I rearrange this for delta y equals kp times delta u then I plug this back down into here I'll see that my y when I plug in tau p is going to be equal to 0 0.632 times delta y so I'm 63.2 percent of the way there for the total change all right, the BYU heating plant uses variable frequency drives, or VFDs, to control liquid flow rates through the pumps instead of valves. So the question is, why would they do that? All right, so you have a pump, and typically you have a valve, and the pump just really has one speed. So this would be a non-variable frequency, uh, just one drive speed, versus a pump, it can adjust its speed to maintain something like pressure. So why would we want to use this instead without the valve? Well this is more expensive to have a variable frequency drive pump but then we don't waste uh, this would be wasted uh, energy and operating costs. If you use a valve then so there's a trade-off. You have uh, capital equipment variable frequency drive you can control the pressure directly with the pump or if you are um, can use a little bit more energy if energy is low cost uh, compared to the capital equipment then you'd want to use a valve instead alright so next question is how do you test the system for nonlinear behavior um, well the simple answer is you can try to fit a linear model all right, so let's say you do a doublet test 
for example, up and down, and then the response goes up and then down and then back up. Well, if the linear model fits, okay, linear dynamic model, if it has a good fit, then you'd say the system is mostly linear. In reality, very few systems are exactly linear or all nonlinear. There's a range in between. So if you had uh, you know, your data um, went up and then went down much more than went up on that doublet test, then you'd say the system is nonlinear because a linear model does not fit that. And if you looked up above here from our first and second order systems, those are linear models. And so it really means if, if you're trying to fit those and you have a different gain or a different time constant or different delay times, then uh, you know, in different operating regions, then you would classify the system as nonlinear. The common one is just to look at the gain, but uh, any of the other parameters as well, the dynamics can also change in different regions as well, and that would make it nonlinear. All right, let's give two examples of final control elements. Um, you know, we already discussed uh, a couple of them already. Valves would be one of them. Okay, it's anything that's going to make a change to the process that we can control or the computer control. You could also have a pump. All right, if you can change the pump or even on off on the pump, that's an actuator. You could also have a heater. Okay, like um, electrical heater or other, some other type of uh, heater that would heat a process stream or a, a, a mass. Okay, so next question is why do we use deviation variables in process control? The short answer is it just makes the math easy. And, and the real reason we do that uh, in deviation variables is because a lot of times we're just looking for the change of a variable. And so if we just start, uh, start at zero, it greatly simplifies the math. For example, when we are linearizing uh, differential equation. Let me write this as uh, dy dt. We first of all linearize about some nominal value and uh, then we have our first derivative. Okay, and um, okay, and then x minus x prime. If we do a steady state uh, value and then also use deviation variables. A steady state is going to make that go to zero. And then this becomes a deviation variable right here. So it, it uh, helps us to define these in terms of the nominal away from the steady state value. And this would be our deviation variable. Okay, so it allows us to collapse those into just a single value and greatly uh, simplifies the math, we start at zero values. So the initial conditions are also zero when we take Laplace transforms. Uh, there's a variety of reasons to do that. Okay, so why do we use process, why do we use transfer functions in process controls? Um, one of the reasons is it relates an input signal to an output signal with blocks that then can be uh, rearranged into block diagrams where we show the flow of information uh, that in these control loops. And so we use transfer functions to express the algebra from the Laplace transforms because we've transformed a lot of these differential equations into algebraic equations. So it relates an input to an output in generally in Laplace domain and allows us to build much more complicated uh, block diagrams to be able to analyze our system. All right, let's give an example of a non-self-regulating process. That might be something like an exothermic reactor, okay, where it takes a regulatory control action to control it, um, uh, okay, to be able to control it to a set point to cause it from not running away. 
Okay, what is derivative kick and how do you eliminate it? Um, the derivative kick is an instantaneous large change in the derivative ter term of a PID controller when using derivative on error. So the error, when you define it as set point minus PV, and then you take the derivative of the error versus time, and derivative kick happens if you have an instantaneous change in something like set point, then that error, that if you look at just the finite difference of the error, then that's going to spike to positive infinity or negative infinity and cause your actuator to saturate instantaneously just for that little set point change. Uh, and so instead of using derivative on error, we typically use derivative on the measurement instead. Okay, we'd use the derivative on measurement in our PID controller, and that eliminates the derivative kick and gives us the same derivative action of our PID controller. How does process uh, dead time affect process control? Is it good or bad, and why? So this uh, dead time, theta p, it makes... Uh, makes the control worse. And the reason for that is that it takes us longer to get a measurement to be able to determine if we're doing the right thing or if we need to have more actuator adjustment. And so we can have things like Smith predictors that can compensate for that, but generally the theta p is bad, it causes a degradation, uh, it makes it worse. Uh, makes control uh, Okay, it makes it worse. All right, let's give the both the Laplace form and the time-dependent forms of the PID equation with derivative on measurement. Okay, so the time domain version first is U of T equals KC times our air plus KC divided by tau I times the integral of the air, and then minus Kc tau d times the derivative of our measurement. So that's in the time domain. And then if we do this in the Laplace domain instead, you could do a u bias here as well. Um, so this is the ideal form. Um, there's other forms, discrete forms that are used in industry, but just to uh, do the the continuous ideal form, uh, here it is in the time domain. In the Laplace domain, we have U of S equals. Now we're just going to do K C times E of S, and then we'll have K C tau I, and then we'll have E of S. Um, okay, divided by S. And then the derivative is just going to be uh, e, it's not going to be e of s because we use the derivative on measurement. And so we're going to have PV of s, and then that's going to be times by s. Okay, when we do the function of s, that does not mean not mean multiply by s. Uh, it's it's going to just be uh, PV, like uh, PV in the Laplace domain. All right, so there it is in the time and uh, Laplace domain. Okay, on a f another exam, I asked you to discuss the trade-offs of computer control with someone like Admiral Rickover. Admiral Rickover was of the nuclear Navy, believed that human operators were more reliable than computers at that time. Uh, so now that you've had a con course in automation control, how would you relate trade-offs of manual versus computer control? All right, so there's advantages and disadvantages to each. Um, all right, so I'll do manual and automatic, and we'll do the advantages and disadvantages of each. Just make a little table here. All right, so if we look at the advantages of uh, manual control, uh, you know, operators uh, better handle... Um, 
fringe cases, like things that the automation is not expecting, such as when computer equipment breaks or um, you know there's a special situation where you have to run something in manual, uh, you know, startup, shutdowns, uh, things like that. Operators might be better adept at handling those cases because they can think and reason through problems. Uh, the disadvantage is that you have to train operators and uh, you know some of the operators are going to be better than others so you're going to have less consistent uh, performance okay all right less consistent performance okay so automatic automation or automatic control um, you know the advantage is that the people uh, can focus uh, can focus on higher level activities uh, so they it removes things um, like things that are dirty dangerous or dull okay it's a really good area for automation to come in and uh, remove some of the humans from dangerous environments from things that are monotonous, uh, that are just repetition over and over again, um, uh, you know, or dirty, you know, just uh, environments that are unsafe. Okay, dirty, uh, dirty, dangerous, or dull work. Okay, so uh, the disadvantage uh, kind of relates to the advantage of manual control is that they can do the wrong thing sometimes if they haven't, if they're not prepared for that fringe case or if something breaks. Okay, so um, perform poorly when there are changes, especially if it's not um, uh, some type of automatic control that adapts to the new changes. All right, so there are some of the trade-offs. Let's go on to this next one. Uh, here's a process that has a following open loop response and the very first thing I need to do is just say that is the controller output and this right here is the measured variable. I just mislabeled those. Alright and so we want to find the process parameters kp, tau p, and theta p assuming an FOPDT model, first order plus dead time model. The data is from a first order system. Okay so uh, the very first thing that we want to do with this graphical fit is go ahead and just get our delta y value. Now the delta y value for this one is going to be equal to 13.5 and then the delta u value okay delta u that's our input is going to be equal to 5. So the very first thing that we can calculate and the easiest thing is our gain all right, and that's 13.5 divided by 5, and that will be equal to, let's see, uh, 2.7. Oh, uh, that went down. Okay, let's see, 2.7. Okay, the next thing that we want to do is just get our dead time. And it looks like the response happens right here about two minutes after we move our manipulated variable, so that's going to be theta p. All right, theta p equals two minutes. All right, now let's go for our time constant. It's going to be how long it takes to get uh, time of delta y times 0 0.632. Okay, and that, uh, if I plug in 13.5 here, then I want to get to about 8.5. All right, so 8.5 is going to be about right here. Okay, so we have to figure out the amount of time after the dead time that it took to get to 8.5. And that's about 8 minutes. All right, so this is going to be our tau p is going to be 8 minutes. All right, so we've gotten our three parameters for the FOPDT model. Okay, now we want to find PI parameters for the system with standard IMC correlations. So let's just select moderate tuning for this. Uh, you probably have this in your notes, but let me just go ahead and repeat that. Uh, tau C equals the max. 
of 1.0 times tau p or 8.0 times theta p. All right. Um, and so that is going to be equal to the larger one is going to be here. It's going to be 16 uh, minutes. All right. So there's our tau c. And then our kc. Okay, this is our controller gain. And we're going to set that equal to 1 divided by kp. And then tau p divided by theta p plus tau c. And if I just take the values from above and that new tau c, the kc equals 0 0.1646. Okay, so there's our KC and then tau I um, equals tau P for IMC tuning. So that's going to be eight minutes. All right, and then our tau D, of course, because we're just using a PI controller, is just going to be zero. All right, now let's go down to the next one. We want to show mathematically that the following system is stable or unstable to a set point change in R or disturbance L. Okay, so you'd have a change in disturbance or a change in the set point. Um, what we need to do first of all is just get our denominator here. So uh, if we do our first one, which is just going to be Y of S divided by R of S. Okay, we're going to do direct divided by 1 plus the loop. So all the things that are in the direct line here, we're just going to put uh, s, s cubed plus 3s squared plus 3s plus 1. All right, and then I go 1 plus everything that's in that loop, and it's the same thing that I had before. All right. Okay, and then if I do my load disturbance as well, I'm going to have a very similar thing here. Um, I just wanted to show this to you because we get two uh, stability analysis. We only have to do the stability analysis once. Okay, so there's nothing here in the direct divided by one plus the loop. It's the same thing as it is here. So our denominator is the same. And so that means we can just analyze one of them. And if it's stable to one of them, it'll be stable for the other one as well. OK, so let's just do it for uh, y over r. And then we'll have the stability analysis as well for the other one. We just need to look at the denominator, OK, just right down here. I'm going to multiply the it by uh, s cubed plus 3s squared plus 3s plus 1. Okay, and uh, so that is going to be s cubed plus 3s squared plus 3s plus 1 plus 10. All right, and then I'm going to use the Routh stability criterion. And what I'll do is I'll just create table here and I'll put my coefficients and then this combines to be 11 and then I need to calculate this value right here and um, that one is going to be 3 times 3 minus 11 times 1 divided by 3 all right and that's going to be negative uh, negative two-thirds. All right, now for this to be stable, all of these have to be on the leading edge. They have to be the same sign. Same, okay, so same sign. And we see that they're not the same sign. So this is going to be unstable. It's going to be unstable both for a change in the load as well as a change in the set point. All right, let's go down to the next one. This one's just a little bit more challenging. 
Okay, but um, very doable still. Uh, all right, so we have a pressure, a, t a drop tube reactor, which is like a heated plug flow reactor. We are adding a pressure controller to the outflow line. The reactor can be approximated as a cylinder that is one meter long and five meters in, or five centimeters in diameter. So there's our one meter, and then we have our five uh, five centimeters here. Okay, diagram is below. At steady state, the inlet is 30, uh, 30 liters per minute. All right, and we have an inlet of 300 Kelvin. All right, the outlet is going to be 1,200 Kelvin. You, know, you might have a heater there that's just maintaining that. Uh, regardless of what pressure there is. So we want to derive an expression for the dynamic change in pressure using a mass balance um, and the ideal gas law. So um, I'm just going to use the calculate the volume. First of all, we're going to need that volume is going to be equal to pi d squared divided by 4 times the height. And that is going to be approximately 0 0.002 meters cubed. All right, there's our uh, volume. I ideal gas law is just going to be PV equals nRT. There's our uh, R is our gas constant and our density. Our density um, is going to be equal to our molecular weight times N divided by V. Okay, and that's going to be P over RG times T times our molecular weight, our molar mass. Okay, so the other thing that we can do is at steady state, we calculate what our Q out is going to be. Okay, now I'm going to just make an assumption here that even with the reaction that uh, the molecular weight uh, doesn't change. So I didn't include that in the problem statement, um, but uh, you know it's going to greatly simplify um, the model here. Okay, Q out. Uh, if we assume that uh, the molecular weight doesn't change and the number of moles uh, don't change, then uh, I guess that isn't very realistic if it's a reactor, but it could be just a very you know s slow or small reaction compared to some of the carrying gas. Uh, so that could be an assumption that we make. The Q out is going to be, with this, this increase in temperature, that's going to be 120 uh, liters per minute. Okay, so we just had the gas flowing through there and it heated up. All right, let's go ahead and derive our expression for the dynamic change in pressure using a mass balance. Okay, so the very first thing we're going to do is just do d m d t equals and then we'll have our mass flow rate in minus our mass flow rate out all right and then uh, let's go ahead and just do mass equals density times volume the volume is going to be constant so we just have a uh, change in density with the change in time equals to oh, that one just zoomed Okay, um, equals to density in times Q in minus density out uh, times Q out. All right, let's go ahead and plug in some of those other uh, quantities that we have. Okay, so this is going to be volume times molecular weight divided by RG times T. Okay, and then we have dp dt. So there's our pressure now. And then that's going to equal the molecular weight times p divided by rg uh, times t in. All right, and then we have q in. All right, and then minus molecular weight times p divided by rg 
times t out, which is just going to be equal to t times q out. All right, so a bunch of things are going to cancel. All right, molecular weight. We have RGs are going to cancel. Okay, and um, let's go on down now. So now we have something that looks like V over T times dP dt equals, now it's going to be pressure times Q in divided by T in uh, minus Q out divided by T out. All right, or if we put everything on one side of the equation, then um, let's see, it's going to be P divided by V, and then I'll have T over T in, and Q in minus Q out. All right, here's our equation. Now we want to linearize this. Um, it's nonlinear because you can see that P is multiplied by Q in or Q out. So let's do our linearization. We're going to do dP dt is approximately equal to the point of linearization. So we're going to plug in our steady state uh, data points. All right, Q in. Oh, my pen is not keeping up with me. Uh, Q in, I'll put in the steady state, and Q out, steady state. All right, and then we're going to add the, this right hand side of the expression. We're going to take the derivative with respect to pressure, and then we're going to plug in the steady state operating conditions, and then do pressure minus uh, pressure bar, which is our nominal pressure. All right, and let's do the same thing for dF dQ in steady state and this is going to be uh, Q in minus Q in bar and then we'll do the final one too okay and this is going to be plug in the steady state conditions and this is going to be Q out minus Q out uh, bar alright so now we just need to get our uh, plug these in. Now the one thing you'll notice with this, if you plug these in, uh, this, okay, and you assume a steady state condition, this is going to go to zero. So we don't need to worry about that. All right, the next one that we want to get is the derivative with respect to pressure. All right, and that's just going to be equal to uh, T divided by T in and we'll have a V in there as well. And then times a Q in minus Q out. Okay, and then that's gonna be, um, those are gonna be the nominal values. So this is going to just be a constant right here. And I'll put P prime, that's our deviation variable. All right, the next one, all right, is gonna be um, plus, is P bar, nominal value divided by V, T divided by T in, and that is going to be times uh, Q in prime. And then I'll have the final one minus P bar over V divided, okay, times Q out prime. All right, now if you plug in the values that we had, this one is also equal to zero. So that term is going to cancel, and then you're just left with uh, those. Okay, so we've linearized and put the expression into deviation variable form. And um, let's go on down to the next one. Perform the Laplace transform of this equation to show an equation for P prime of S in terms of Q in and Q out. All right, so I'm going to do S times P of S equals, and then I'm just going to call this one alpha, and I'll call that beta. So I'll have alpha times Q in of S plus beta times Q out of S. 
And then if I have a transfer function, uh, I'm going to have P of S over Q in of S equals alpha divided by S and P of S over Q out of S equals beta divided by S. So these are going to be transfer functions. So if I have Q in of S, okay, I'm going to have this uh, transfer function, which is, uh, I'll, this is just going to be alpha divided by S. Okay, and that's going to be added together with the beta divided by S. It comes from the Q2 input. And that is going to lead to, oh, I did the wrong output here. That is going to lead to the new pressure. All right, let's go on down to the next one. This is a process placed in manual mode. A step change of six in the controller output resulted in the following change in the process variable. Okay, so we have here, we have uh, delta y. All right, delta y is going to be equal to 70. And we have delta u was equal to 6, just from the problem statement. And uh, we want to be able to calculate, just do a graphical fit of our second order uh, system here. Um, OK, so the first thing that we need is the overshoot, because we can calculate uh, overshoot uh, very easily with you know a uh, formula from an underdamped second order system. So we have zeta equals, and it's going to be square root of the natural log of the overshoot, and then we're going to square that, and then divide it by pi squared plus uh, the same thing, natural log of the overshoot, and we'll square that. So we need to get our overshoot to get zeta. So we're leveling out at about 70. Okay, it's close. I'll just say 70, and then we went about 30 over. Okay, and this was 70 right here, so our overshoot is going to be 30 divided by 70. And that is going to be, okay, 0 0.43. And if I plug that in down here, that's going to give me um, a value of 0 0.26. Okay, that's my zeta value. Now I want to get my gain as well. I had my delta y of 70 and my delta u of 6. And so kp equals delta y uh, divided by delta u. And so that's 70 divided by 6. And that equals 11.67. OK, the next one that I want to get is my uh, second order time constant. And I can use another formula, uh, 1 minus uh, this zeta damping factor squared uh, divided by pi times my peak time. Now my peak time is going to be from when the step happened to how much time it took to get to the first peak up here. And that's going to be about 8 minutes. So if I plug in 8 minutes here and then I plug in my zeta value right here, that's going to give me a second order time constant of 2.46 minutes. All right, so I have all of my values. I just assumed that theta p was equal to zero minutes. It didn't look like there was a lot of dead time here. Um, and so I just assumed that what is going to be zero. All right, let's go down to the next one. We have the block diagram. We want to find the expression for uh, y, how it relates to ysp, and also L1 and 
L2. And so there's a couple hints here. We'll use the shortcut method for the inner loop to get X1. X1 is one of these intermediate, um, this is our secondary controller output, the thing that we're measuring from our secondary controller. We want to get that as a function of E and L1. All right, and then we'll derive an expression for y as a function of x1 and l2, and then derive an expression for e as a function of y is p and y. And then we'll derive the overall transfer functions. Okay, so basically what we want to do is we want to take our first, this inner block here, right here, and condense it down into a single block that is going to be... Um, L how L1 okay I'll call this G uh, inner loop uh, inner loop 2 and then we'll add that to what comes from E is going to be our input alright and then we want to do G inner loop 1 all right, and then that's going to be x1 coming out. So we're going to condense it down just to these two blocks. So the way we do that is just use the shortcut method. We're going to, okay, so let's go ahead and do our first one, which is just going to be x1 of s divided by l1 of s, and that's going to be direct divided by 1 plus the loop. So we have g l1 divided by 1 plus whatever's in the loop there. So that's GC2, G2, and H2. That is sloppy. Okay, there you go. All right, and then the next one that we want to get, okay, so this is G inner loop 2. Let's go for G inner loop 1. All right, now this one, this one is going to be our uh, x1 of s divided by our air. Okay, let's do our direct divided by 1 plus a loop. g, c1, g, c2, and g2 divided by 1 plus and then this leaves out the GC1, we just have the GC2, G2, and then H2. Okay, so now we can just replace what's inside of there with this smaller one, and then do direct divided by 1 plus a loop on this one as well to get our overall transfer functions. So let's just do that. I'm going to try to keep everything on the screen here. I'll just do it off to the right. Okay, you won't have this obviously on your paper, uh, but just um, try to keep things on the same screen. Um, let's get our y y of s divided by y s p of s. Okay, so direct is going to be equal to g inner loop one, and then I'm going to have g one. GP divided by 1 plus whatever's in the loop. And so then I'm going to have the same thing as in, in the numerator. Inner loop 1, G1, GP. And then I'm going to have H1 and H3. Okay, so there's my very first one right there. And I would just need to take my inner loop one. And if I want to make it really complicated, I can plug that one back in there. Okay, but uh, not necessary. All right, let's do the next one. L1. Okay, so I have L1 now. All right, and I want to get a Y of S divided by L1 of S. Now let's do our direct. So I'll have G inner loop two, G1, GP divided by 1 plus, and then whatever's in the loop. It's going to be the same thing for all of these denominators. Um, all right, so that's going to be G, I, L, 1, G, 1, G, P, 
h1, h3. There's another transfer function. And then I have ys over L2 of s. Direct is just going to be g L2, gp. And then the same loop denominator as all of them have. Okay, there's my third one. So it looked pretty complicated at the beginning, but if you just break it down with this inner loop right here, all right, and uh, using the shortcut method for turning loops into transfer functions, then we can get a simplified expression and do that again for the outer or the master loop. All right, so that is it. There's the final exam. Again, the flow chart. We'll go back up here. We visited a lot of these. We started with uh, definitions. And it uh, looks like it just disappeared on me. Okay, but let me go to the, uh, the course website. And I'll just show you where okay where it is on the course website okay here's the uh, overall uh, flow of the information uh, how we do the controller design with the modeling and then the controller development and I'll post this video and also the practice exam here under the final exam review there's also another uh, practice final exam and uh, with a couple of videos there as well uh, this one's a much shorter exam. The one that we just went through is more typical of a three-hour uh, comprehensive final. All right, I uh, hope that helped. And, uh, you know, as usual, we'd love to answer any questions. So leave comments in the video, and I'll include those links in the video description as well.